more sobbing when he starts throbbing that old sweet song. Wake up, wake up, you sleepyhead, get up, get up, get out of bed, cheer up, cheer up, the sun is red, live, love, laugh and be happy. Welcome to the first episode of 2022 of the Red Robin podcast with special guest Chris Wellham. Chris, it's great to speak to you and we're going to get to you in a two minutes or so, but Chris Johnson, the other Chris that we're not that bothered about, <laughs> uh, oh, it's our first one with our sponsors, mate, In it? Obviously, we announced it a few days ago, Budget Tyres, 360 Chartered Accountants. They're going to get involved this year. We're going to be pumping their adverts in out once we get started. Really positive meetings you had just um, pre before Christmas. So can you tell us a bit about the sponsors and obviously what they're going to bring? It's going to be really interesting. And I think it shows how much the podcast develops that two homegrown sponsors that want to get involved with the Red Robin podcast. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 360 Chat Accountants, obviously quite a renowned local accountancy firm. Um, they pride themselves on being a little bit different and the, the big backers of, of grassroots sport and also big backers of Old Kingston Rovers. So delighted that we was able to get them on board. They saw a lot of value in the work that we've been doing with the podcast and, and they was really keen to back us with it. So it's it's great to have them on board and and Budget Tires Auto Centre, uh, Paul and Sue down there are uh, big backers of... Uh, of, of rovers as well i think chris goes down there and gets his tires fixed they was telling me uh get you know the they do everything tires mot servicing um and again they they was really keen to get on board so so what's been great is that the really good people both at 360 and at budget tires auto centers so our listeners uh our viewers we'd urge you to to get in touch with them if you need any accountancy if you need your tires doing an mot on your car you know they're supporting us. They're not only supporting us, they're, they're supporting the club. Um, so any any way that we can help them, and any way that you can help them, it'll be uh, greatly appreciated. Yeah, and we get is it a thousand quid? Everyone that goes there, isn't it? Something like that. So if you recommend, if you say man <laughs> and Chris's name, it pays for our mortgages. No, I'm only messing. <laughs> Let us move on then, Chris Wellham. It is great to speak to you, buddy. How's you know Happy New Year? I hope you had a good Christmas and a New Year. How's everything in your household? Obviously, a bit of unprecedented times as it's been for the past two years, but everything going okay at the minute? It is, mate. Yeah, thank you for having us as well. Happy New Year to you both. Um, Christmas has been great, mate. Um, two, two young kids, uh, obviously magical when when kids are that age and they believe in it all. And um, yeah, as I say, it's been the, been the best, one of the best Christmas we've had so far, yeah. So are you living in Manchester or are you in Hull? No, I'm back in Hull, yeah. You're yeah. back in Hull now, yeah. Well, obviously, we, as we always do, Chris will speak about what you're doing, you know, after Rugby League. Obviously, you're still playing at the Sheffield Eagles now, going into, is this your fourth, fifth club now? Is it fourth? Um, yeah, okay, uh, Bradford, Salford, Ferguson, Sheffield. Yeah, yeah fifth. fifth. Yeah, so we've got loads to speak about, mate. But as always, let's go right back to the start. So, obviously, uh, 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 plenty of you had two brothers, don't you? Play rugby as well, growing up. Whereabouts in all did you grow up and when was, you know, obviously growing up in a city like Hull, you're either black and white or red and white. What was you growing up, your family playing? How did you get involved with the sport of rugby league that served you so well? Yeah, well, first of all, grew up on, on Orchard Park, um, mm -hmm. just in North Hull. Uh, um, big family. I've got, uh, I'm one of eight eight children. I've got four, four brothers and three sisters. Uh, and he said two of my brothers play rugby and still do play rugby uh, they're playing this year uh, it's the Hurricane they've changed the name to Hurricane Hurricane, yeah, I'm hurricane going Flyers to play at the Midlands oh yeah that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah they, play, they play for them now um, but I mean growing up growing up and starting rugby I was always a football player um, until probably about 14 15 years old and it was only by by chance I started playing rugby league it was um, at school the school rugby team was short of numbers one time and um, the the teacher there asked me if I'd just fill in. Um, I played a game and, and enjoyed it, and since then never looked back. Started playing amateur for Might and Warriors. Played there for about about six six months, and then I got picked up by LSC. But at the start of it all, what age was that when you when you signed for LFC? That was um, my last year at school, so I'd have been about about sixteen, yeah. seventeen, yeah. yeah. 16. When you yeah. was playing at Mighton, was there anyone who went pro with you or was there anyone like in the local area who would know who you growing up playing with? <laughs> no, there was um, a couple that when I, when I finally went to OKR Academy, there was a few players yeah. there uh, always in the same team, such as John Fallon, um, yeah, yeah. Chris Peacock, he was there, one of them. 
and I, I, I'm sure there's one more, but I can't remember his name. There's only a couple from from Mighton that um, I say because I started very late playing rugby. I didn't, I didn't really, and I only played six months at, at Mighton before I got picked up and got put in an academy. So I was fairly new to it. All. I didn't really know many players or who was good, who was getting picked up in academies and stuff. So I was, a, I was a, a, a new kid on the block sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And at what? the time you was at Hull, when did the move to Hull Kingston Rovers come about? Because obviously we was in the championship. Sorry for interrupting, Chris. We was in the championship at the time. When did you know your time with the Black and Whites was coming to an end? And how did that move to East Hull happen? Because obviously we was probably was gone pro only just though with the new you know era of Morgan Neil Hudgel becoming chairman. It was quite exciting times. When did that happen for you? Yeah, I probably probably about I played about a year, maybe not even that for Hull FC, and I was I played it. And a handful of games, but I just got got the sense when I was there that they, they had the sort of favourite players and out say I was a new camp played that long. I didn't feel like I was getting a, a look in and I said that for myself it felt like they had a few favourite players and key players and uh, I just thought the opportunity came for OK I came stiff and that's what, what I would do if I want to come across across the river to them and I thought I'd have a better chance um applying myself at OK than then I get my nose in at OFC because I said they had, it seemed like they had the favourites now. I wouldn't have a chance there. Yeah, you said you'd only been playing for well quite a short amount of time, Chris. Was it was it your physical size what you think what you think they they was interested in, or did you have just natural skill, or was it a combination of everything? I think a bit of everything. Yeah, you know, I, I'm one of them kids that any any sport I'm really competitive and I like to do my best and. I always seem to be quite good at it. if you put a new spot in front of me, I'll pick it up quite easy and, and, and go along with it and um, probably be, be one of the best players at it. Um, and so I think it would have been a new spot. It was new to me, exciting. And I, I said, I picked it up really well. Um, and I just like fell in love with it, yeah. Didn't look back. So let's take you back to 2006. Obviously, if you was in the Rovers setup, Rovers was was going really well. Some record scores in the Championship. The year we went up, we knew we was already in the semi final. So Justin um, dropped, well, rested a few players, and you and your brother got the chance to play. You was both on the wing. Uh, Lee Centurions, I believe, at the old Hilton Park, quite a ruthless place to go back in the day. We got beat quite thoroughly because we had a lot of young lads like yourself yeah. and the people you mentioned, John Fallon. But you scored on your Rovers debut. How did that come about? When did you know you was going to make your debut? And even though the result wasn't the best, we knew we was going to go to a semi-final and you'd finally made your Rovers debut, especially for your family, mate, you and Liam making your debuts. It must have been a proud moment. Do you remember much in that game? I remember the blue kit you was wearing. It was a, it was a crack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Probably found out beginning of the week. Uh, Morg, Morg said like he's going to, I said, rest a few, few of the senior boys and put some young lads in and, me and Liam got got the nod, as you said, and uh, you know before that we played probably two two and a half years in the academy playing together every week. So we knew what it was like playing together. But I mean, making your first team debut with, with your brother is something special, and not not too many people get to do that. So it was a proud moment, not for us but our family as well. Our parents was buzzing. Uh, they all came down. I said to the the old league around Hilton Park, uh, watched us, and I said uh, I managed to get get a try on my debut. Um, which is always good for a young kid. Everyone, everyone dreams of doing that, playing for their hometown club, scoring a try on debut. And you know, Lee, Liam actually scored in that game as well, but um, it got it got chalked off for for one reason. So, but he always he's adamant that it was it should have been a try. Um, so that would have been that would have been another bonus and, and and a nice thing to to look back on both scoring. But yeah, it didn't quite happen uh, there. But um, it's just unfortunate that that Liam didn't really kick on or. Um, stay at OKR long enough and we could have uh, progressed together through through the ranks and, and years. Yeah, you set a few records during your time at Rovers and I think that's the, the only time that brothers have made the debut at the club. Right, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, talk, I mean, talk us through that transition from academy to first grade rugby because obviously now we've got the, the reserves coming back. We've got uh, Jewel Reg, what we've had. Uh, but to go from a, academy rugby straight into a, a first team setup. Yeah, yeah, you know, as a young kid as well, I said not playing too long, um, playing in the academy a couple of years. So, and I, I, I knew the environment when I was being around the first team, uh, having a few pause sessions against them in training sessions. So, you get to know a few of the players that way. But you know, it's just, it's just nerves and anxious and what to expect. Um, the the professionalism steps up. You know, 
in the academy still looked at back in them days still looked at as, as young kids and then you go into play fully men fully grown men and you know as much as we was 18 years old whatever it was 17 18 years old and you get thrown in the first team it, it, it feels like a different level and um, but you know the excitement and the buzz, and that's what you want to do as a young kid. If you if you're coming through the academies like like we did, me and my brother, the ultimate goal is to play first team, and, and when you achieve that, there's no better feeling. No, and in that 2006 campaign, even though the championship there was some team that I remember us being at the top, you was always fighting with Lee Halifax, really good, and then you had some at the bottom. See, like it is now, like it always will be because of funding. But Rovers, especially in the outside backs, where you and Liam was playing. You look back at Ben Kane, Leroy Rivette, Katoria, Gareth Morton, John Steele, John Goddard, them players, a vast experience. That must have helped your game a lot, especially for a team that was playing in the second tier at the time. He was playing with some players who represented Scotland at Rugby Union. You had Ben yeah. Kane, a live wire, a young, you know, a starlet at the time. It must have, you know, helped your game a lot, Chris. It was, yeah. You know, I said all the experienced players that you've just mentioned, there's always always kind enough and helpful enough and I always wanted to help us young lads and put, put us in the right direction and giving us tips how to do things right, uh, how to improve things. Um, and, you know, I just want to put a record like a massive a massive influence on Mark and taught me a lot, not not just Justin Morgan, but Andrew Webster as well. He was, he was massive because he was part of the academy setup as well um, back then uh, and he, he had a massive influence on on where I've got to now. I think if you look at Andrew Webster, Chris, you know, people forget about him. And like Chris has just said, he's an assistant coach. I think he's been at the... Um, Her 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 yeah. Her Her is, he really went under the radar. And obviously James at the time was our star man and then ended up being a Rovers legend for what he did. But I think Andrew Webster and Morgan, young coaches, Chris Wellham, he's going to be hard to yeah. differentiate you two. But <laughs> for, for them two, that was their first gig and what careers they've had as well. So I think it was really grateful at the time. And that's probably why we ended up going up. Obviously, you didn't feature much in that 2006 campaign. But what can you tell us your experiences watching as a player on the fringes, on the subs, you know, with the subs and stuff of that victory at the Halliwell Jones against Widnes? Because it was a proud day. I mean, I can't remember it much. I was only young at the time. But looking back at the videos and the commentary, it just that was when it all came together and Rovers had finally made it out of the second tee, which we've been dying to do so much. It must have been a good after party, mate, for you and the boys. It was, yeah, yeah. Um, again, I remember, remember that game. Um, I won't even sat in the dugout then um, mm. during that game. I was like just a just a normal specky in the, in the stand watching. <clears throat> um, so you can imagine the atmosphere and the buzz and, and the scenes after the, after they went up. And you know, I said the party after was was unbelievable. Everyone buzzing. And again, it's a it's an ultimate goal of not just all KR but a lot of players playing Super League and, and getting the club back back into the top tier. So it was a massive massive goal achieved and. Uh, Unreal day, I'll never forget. And you know, it's funny enough because on that day, I think it was the the game before, and obviously Caterham is the one after. That it was Sheffield, Sheffield versus someone, uh, and Sheffield got promoted to the championship. Uh, and the coach of Sheffield Eagles then is was Gary Wilkinson, uh, <laughs> and and I've married his daughter. <laughs> so it's a bit of a bit of a, a good day. Then. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it ended up being a good day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what what was the uh, the conversations at that time, Chris, with with yourself and about, you know, what were the club telling you about the what they saw saw uh, you doing in the future, especially with promotion to the Super League. Yeah, you know, they they were really keen and um, insistent on on me staying and be be part of it, and you know, what young kid wouldn't, you know, just being promoted to the Super League, you you playing for your hometown club, it would it'd be stupid. Stupid in myself to say, oh, nah, no thanks, thanks for the offer, but no, <laughs> you know. So that was really, really keen. Me being a local lad, um, they want a lot of local lads, and um, to play for Fulke. And you know, during during our time, we did have a lot of a lot of young young lads, such as Jordan Cox, Liam Salter, mm. um, Aaron Ollett. Um, there, there was there was a load a load of whole lads that was playing for Fulke, which which was good and what Justin Morgan and Nigel wanted. So going into Super League, you scored on your championship debut, scored on your Super League debut. We must have thought it's easy this first team, lad. <laughs> yeah. When when we um in Super League, when you played against Wigan, it, again we got beat, but it was the was it the last game of the season or the second last? We knew yeah, we were yeah. up, didn't we? Yeah. For you making that Super League debut, how was that 2007 season for you? Did you feature mainly predominantly for the I don't remember you going on loan, was you mainly with the Academy again and then obviously got your chance yeah, at the yeah. Super League and 
scoring against Wigan, it must have been a great achievement, mate. And obviously, that's when you really started to, you know, think is this is what I'm going to do for my job now? Did that is that when you realised, God, I'm it's quite serious. I'm playing in Super League, playing against Wigan, one of the best teams of any, you know, northern or southern hemisphere. It must have been a good day again. Yeah, it was, mate. Yeah, I said playing playing for Ulkia, um was a great achievement and. Make my championship debut was something that I, I dreamt of, and you know, when, once I got promoted, the ultimate goal then was to play, get my foot in the door, have a game, play a game of Super League, and you know, it came against Wigan towards the back end of the year, um, which again it was just a different level, you know, compared to the championship. Uh, but managed to managed to sneak over, as you said, on, on, for a try. Um, so again, another proud moment for myself, the family, um, and I, I just remember. I remember during that game, I got absolutely whacked. I think by Trent Barrett, uh, and I thought, bloody hell, I'm get, gonna get this every week. <laughs> so that that was the downside of it. Looking looking back on that, but you know that the the year after, um, I think I played probably half the season, a lot more games than than I did. Um, so you know that two thousand and two thousand and eight, I think it was, um, was my really probably my breakthrough year, and that's when I I really kicked on and um, played a lot more games. Yeah, and if you look at that, two, I was going to say, if you look at that 2008 season, I mean, some of them games were absolutely crazy. Some of the score lines, so you know, you look at how many points were scored, how many points were shipped during that season. It must have been, I mean, exciting for you being an attacking player, but also you've got your responsibilities in defence as well. How, how did you adapt between your defensive responsibilities and your and your attacking go forward? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, no, I never shied away from this, and I always say I was. I was a, a great attacking player. I was I was very average, very average in defence. You know, I was I was always all about attacking. Uh, I loved the ball in the end and scoring tries. And you know, um, defence defence. I needed a lot more improvement in defence. I want I want the best the best defender. But um, you know, I, I was I was an attacking player. I loved 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 being on the ball and and, and scoring tries. As I said, so it was it was part and parcel of the game. And I got away with a lot of it with players in and around me. Yeah, and you mentioned how good 2008 was for you breaking out, but you look at 2009, I mean, injuries, awful injuries to Webster and Chev Walker. I mean, that Chev Walker one breaking his leg, yeah, yeah, yeah. horrendous at Headingley, wasn't it? But for you, you started 32 games. Rovers finished fourth. We got to the semi-final. You know, we lost against Leeds and then Wigan eventually, you know, was quite close to getting to our first grand final. That was when you look back and with San Galea, you had your Newton, Scott Morell, people like Fitzhenry and yourself, Briscoe. The list goes on, mate. Yeah. I remember that season. I remember getting beat in that semi, but that was when we thought, do you know what? This team can probably go somewhere. Do you remember it just probably similar to what Rovers have just done in 2021? Not the favourites, very much the underdogs, play a bit free lib, you know, very... Um, structured in some way, but then just off the cuff whenever they want to be. And that's what probably worked. And some of the teams, I was looking at some of the fixtures when we was doing a bit of research on you earlier. The teams was beating Warrington away, Saints away. Yeah, yeah. Unprecedented. Yeah. That must have been a great time. And is that a really tight group You know, group of lads? You look at there was a lot of Hullborn lads as well who was coming up and um, through the ranks and a lot of experience there. That was a very good season. It was, mate. That's, I'd say that was probably our best, probably the best yeah. season, barring the one that you just had now. Probably Ulkar's best season in the terms of where they finished in the league and how far they got. Um, and you just mentioned all them players, um, great against senior, experienced players, probably international players as well, such as Sean Briscoe. Um, you know, bringing Ben Glear, um, Clint New and Mick Vella, them kind of players. They really brought that the Australian professionalism with them and what what clubs of there do and expect and they brought it into Ulkiar and you know it really changed the dynamics of the players and the staff and you know really brought that extra level of professionalism at the club and I think that really took us took us that one step further and was a big a big part of why we went so well that year. Yeah, I was going to ask you about you know players like Ben Glear and that and, and when they come into the club. I mean, like you said, you're quite you was relatively new to rugby league when you signed for FC and obviously came across the Rovers. Did you ever get sort of starstruck, or was you just was they just the next sort of lads in the camp and 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 you just got on with a job um, because you know you you weren't really that bothered about who there was. Yeah, especially the Australian players because. I say well, we've been new new to to rugby. I didn't. I never watched any Australian rugby. I didn't know who anyone was coming across there. And uh, you know the the English lads. I, I knew who there was. And uh, so Australian lads. I want I want or anything. But you know the way the way they conducted mm -hmm. themselves and 
as I said, the professionalism they brought was was a completely different level to what what us English lads was was, was like. Um, so as I said, that really that really bored as well. But I mean, I don't think I was ever starstruck by anyone. You know, I was I was. What made it so easy was the boys that we was playing with, such as the, the Sean Briscoes, the Chev Walkers, the Jake Webster, the Scott Morales. Dead as accepted you as as one of them. You know, you're just a normal lad at training. You're, you're part of the team. You're part of them. And so it was never like, oh, I'm because I've played international. I played X amount of Super League games. I'm better than you. You know, everyone was everyone was the same, and it was great to be around. Just before we go on to anything else, Joe, Scott Morell, Chris. What was he like? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, he does yeah. listen to these as well, so be careful what you say because he's got quite Mate, a mouth on him, as you know, we've had him yeah. on this before. Absolute, absolute <laughs> menace. He just messing around all the time, pranks all the time. Even now, you know, like, when I've been playing for Bradford in Championship and, and Featherstone last year, when we're, when we're playing against Scott, he just... It's just constantly harassing you of it, yeah. calling you calling you a ginger so and so and you you shit and all stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, it, it just doesn't stop. It like no. right, shut up, Scott, just play rugby, but it's just constantly at it. And that, yeah, that's remember, what that, that's what it's been like throughout his full career. Yeah, I remember Chris when was in the championship. Do you remember that hit he did on Ben Kakane? I think he made about three tackles and did yeah. five runs, and every single one of them was at Ben Kakane. <laughs> yeah. um, he is he's a true, true character. And again, before we move on to our next question, remember, guys, if you've got any questions, if you're watching on YouTube and Facebook Live and Twitter, thank you as always. Retweet and share and um, ask Chris any questions, and we'll do them in between our conversation. Playoffs, we move on to that. Before 2021, before the Warrington victory and the defeat in the south of France, it was 2013 was the last time Rovers had made the playoffs. But for your team, your predominant team, who we've just spoke about, mate, you made it quite a lot. And the most famous playoff game, barring the one that's just been at the Halliwell Jones, was the 2010 one against our nearest and dearest. I want to speak a bit about them because I always think you, and I think it's lost a bit now, I'll be honest, it's lost that, not integrity, he's the biggest guy in rugby league, but the likes of Scott Morell, Ben Kikane, Newton, and you especially, used to give it to their fans a lot. And I remember some of the tries, some of the celebrations. I mean, that that one at Magic Weekend, you and Josh Hodgson's just yeah, yeah. It's one of the funniest photos you'll ever see. You can look at every one of their fans and there's a, there's a story to tell and I'm sure you'll get a bit of stick <laughs> off them. But tell us, a whole grown lad, obviously born on Orchard Park, growing up with family who would have been black and whites, friends who were black and whites, that derby, especially them playoff games, mate, the atmosphere, and at the time, we had quite a bit over them. They did beat us a few times, but predominantly we was the biggest team in Hull at that moment, if you'll yeah. agree. And what was it like, especially them games at KC with 24,000 people in, and that playoff, no different. And I remember my favourite bit is when you scored from that kick, the scholarship lads from all FC doing the playoffs, a kid in full all FC gear, you scoring, he jumps up and jumps in the Rover stand. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah. If you watch it back your try, watch it. It's literally right next to you when you put your arms up to the Rovers fans. I'll never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I remember I remember that game that we're talking about, that that mm. twenty ten playoff game and especially that try. You know, it pops up now and again on on social media, and I, I every time it pops up, I always watch it back because can tell you as a football player. Yeah, it always brings back <laughs> their, their memories and feelings, and you know, derby derby games was always unbelievable. Um, you know, at the case, like you said, twenty four thousand. Um, you can't hear yourself. You can't hear yourself talking and thinking in your own head. It's unbelievable and the noise that our fans made as well. To say we had that one stand behind the sticks. Um, unbelievable atmosphere. There's all the best games and the ones that you look for as soon as the the calendars came out, but you know, being a local Hull lad, and I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to say this, or, or being a being a Hull KF fan. And when I was younger, because Hull FC was in the Super League, I went and watched them. I went and watched them all the time because because it was sort of like in the Premier League, <laughs> there was a better team. And That's so all I've got and... time for anyhow, Chris. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I'm just getting the edit button ready. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now I was at the KC watching them for for yeah. a season or two, and then obviously jumped into their academy and, and, and then jumped ship to to Ulkia. And because I was at Ulkia for such a long time, uh, I just grew and loved Ulkia. And obviously being a part of the team and every every I was there every match day. Obviously part of the squad, part of the academy, and then into the first team. I was there probably total about 12 or 13 years at Hockey and just grew and loved them. And, you know, all, all FC became became the enemy. And as I said, a lot of celebration and, and try scored against them. It, it, it showed in, in the celebrations and the reactions and emotions after. 
I was going to say, Chris, how did they um, did they like some of the Aussie lads look to you to for you to tell them the sort of the importance of the derby and and explain some what it means to to the supporters in the city? Yeah, you know, throughout throughout numerous years uh, on on derby day or derby week uh, leading up to the game, we'd do obviously training and watching some video on them, and probably our last session before before the game would get. A lot of the coaches would get someone in, like an ex, an ex player, uh, an ex older player who's, who's been around, uh, and really tell tell the boys and the Aussie boys what it means, what it means to them, what it means to all the of club, what it means to the city, the people walking the streets, um, and it really got really got the boys fired up, even even got the local lads fired up, um, and and I said the Auss- the Aussies bought into that and. You know, as you said, we we probably came out a lot of times on top of them derby games. Yeah, sorry, Chris. I've got a question off Craig Escrit, so we'll go into that. He said, who was the best player you played with at Rovers, but who had the biggest impact on terms of improvement? So that might come into the same one, but that's from Craig Escrit on YouTube. So get asking your questions, guys. Probably the best best player, I would say, probably Michael Dobson. Yeah, you know, and I, I played with him at, at Salford as well, and he was exactly the same. You know, ultimate professional, did everything right, looked after himself, um, great rugby league player, and um, he could he could boss a team around the field and manage a team exceptionally well. Um, and he did he did that at at OKR for a lot of years, and and at Salford for a lot of years as well. So I would I would say him, I would say Dobbo, yeah. Yeah, it was a good player, wasn't it, Chris? I mean, we looked at some of the highlights, especially when you see Dobson's highlights and yours. Worked very well together. I remember his little show and go. You benefited a lot from that. Was was he probably, again, that best player? Just He, he could just create some out of nowhere. He had that spark, didn't he? And for a kid who'd you know, not been known in the NRL, he came over. Yeah. Um, you look at them players, but Dobson up there with one of the best rovers I've probably ever seen for skill-wise. I mean, we just watched him and adored him from the stands, but it, it, he digged us out of some holes, didn't he? Especially yeah, he was, you know, yeah. your side as well. You scored a lot of tries from Dobbo. Yeah, it yeah, was unbelievable. He, he said he could play, could show and go. He could kick the ball unbelievably as well. Great, great with the boot. And he'd, he'd bring out the best in players because... If you messed up or made an error, whatever, he'd be into you. He'd, he'd scream and tell you off. And um, so he was really, really on edge not to let him down. Um, and that, that's what he won. That's what brings the best out in in everyone. If you if you're getting bollocked and told off by your teammates, it, it it means a bit more, hurts a bit more, and you don't want to do it again to let him down again. And you know that's what Dobbo did. Yeah, and I suppose with that as well, there's a way of doing it, isn't there? You know, you, it's alright having someone bollocking you, but. You know, there's a way of doing it, and there's a time for doing it. And like Joe said, it's it's good having someone like Dobbo in the team who's so skillful. But the players around him need to be able to read him. And and I think that was what was unique about Rose at the time is there was such a togetherness and such a, a unity between you all that you know Dobbo could come up with a miracle play, and it probably won on off the training ground. But you'd know where the ball was going, you'd know where the pass was going, you'd know what run to make, and it was almost telepathic at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, that that comes with, I said, the the togetherness of the squad and the professionals and that we had, and you know, just a great camaraderie of, of the of the squad. And you know, when when things like off the cuff do happen and and the bounce of the ball goes for you and things happen and people are in the right place, it all comes down to being being happy and confident and you know having a, having a great atmosphere in the camp, and that's what we had. Yeah, and I think when you look at them players, that's why we did so well. But from an individual point, we've spoke about when you break through season wars and everything like that. But probably a standout is 2011. There was plenty of stuff that happened in that season, mate. You scored 26 tries, two hat-tricks. You even got a goal at Cardiff at the Millennium Magic. You earned an England Knights call-up. You played in the first ever one of that. And you signed a four-year contract extension with the Robins. Not a bad season, 2011. Was that probably the most enjoyable you've had? Probably the best season statistics-wise. But very good season from Old Car. But a lot of incidents that year. We want to talk about you as well. But what was your feelings of a certain Mr Mason in 2011? Because we've got <laughs> a few people... We've had a few people like the Dobbos and Scott's Morels who influenced in that 2011 side as well. But what's your perspective of it? Because obviously it was such a big deal. And then you look and you have a joke about it now, but we speak about heroes and all stuff like that. He was a bit of a villain coming over, but probably like Jake Connor is at all. He's a villain if you hate him like we all do. But as a whole fan, you'd love him, whereas we was doing that for Mason yeah. until he played his six games and cleared off. That was a weird time, wasn't it? But great for you, 2011. 
Yeah, yeah. Personally, 2011 was probably the best year, best year that I've had. Uh, again, stats wise, tries, England nights, call up, contract extension, everything was going right. Loved my time, loved my time, enjoyed my rugby, and you know I was on on top of the world at that time. Uh, there's no, there was no other place that I wanted to be. I playing rugby. That's why, that's why we signed a big contract, uh, a long contract. Mm. Uh, but you know, going going to going over to to Willie Mason, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that about him signing because we didn't have no another another thing about that. We didn't have no quarter spots for him. So no. at the time, double going back to double, double was injured, and we had to deregister double. Uh, I don't know if it, many people know that we had to deregister yeah. Dobbo and mm-hmm. to sign Mason, um, and then when Dobbo was injured, the, the next question I was: When Dobbo comes back and he's fit, what happens then? Yeah. What, what, what do we deregister then to get Dobbo back on? But you know, as you said, Mason played about six six games and then and then cleared off, so that that wasn't a worry in the end. But you know, it was a, it was a massive play, and everyone knew he was reput- the reputation he had and stuff like that. So it was massive. Full care, but you know, it just didn't work out, did it? Uh, no. John, who would you were deregistered? I'm trying to think who was it? Who was the quarter spots? Dobbo, Newton, Galea, Ben Fisher, Vela, um, Blake at the time. Blake Green was here, wasn't he, in 2011? It'd have been a tough call to make for Morgan. I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was gonna say, mate, you just reel off all them names. Oh, yeah, 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 but when someone like Will, when someone like Willie Mason comes available, you know, you're not gonna. You're not going to sort of turn your nose up at that, but it's probably just the the, the wrong player at the r- wrong time, wasn't it? Yeah. I think he was doing a tour of rugby union in in Northern Hemisphere and probably looking at where he could get a bit more money where he could, which as a professional, why not? You know, it's a short career in it, but ultimately it didn't work out for him. And, you know, like, Joe, I, I don't have an opinion because we just didn't see him enough in a rover shirt, did we? No, we didn't. I'd, I'd like to get him on the podcast. He does oh, he's, so big, he's big time, mate. He's big. He's, he's, <laughs> that's no disrespect to you, Chris. <laughs> I'll see you later. Me, me Chris, <laughs> have, you, have you still got your flag? He's still got his little flag. I remember all of them. <laughs> yeah, but, and the cardboard cutouts, weren't they? Yeah, cardboard cutouts, a bit of a mockery. <laughs> Tell us about England Knights, really big achievement. Did you play France or Wales? or? Yeah, France. We played France and uh, a Cumbria, Cumbria Select. Yeah, I think um, there was a few old lads, weren't they? I remember Danny Allen played in it, yourself. Was that, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, the Cumbria Select game, that was the first one. What was your experiences of that? I mean, we've spoken, we had George Lawler on the show, it was obviously last a few weeks ago, and he's played in the England Knights now against Jamaica. I always ask the same question, but for you, I think it's massive. How big's having that step up? Because uh, we go on bang and bang on about how good Australia is in the international game in the Southern Hemisphere. But for us to have that, competitiveness to have the under 18s then the reserves at England then the Knights or whatever you want to call it people really benefit from that and for you who experienced it first and the first yeah. ever go obviously there was a lot of tweaks that needed ironing in and out at the time but a great um, achievement for you mate to represent your country in a brilliant honour especially to get the victory as well yeah yeah you know um when I first got called up, it was actually to the to the England train on squad, and then um, later on down the line, where I didn't get picked for the, the England squad, that's when I got sort of, if you will, put down to the night squad. Um, so I've been actually been in in that first team England squad and been around. God, every every experienced super player you can think of, world class English player, was unbelievable. The, the expect the expect it expectations that came with that and the, the level of skill and rugby league that you needed to be to be just watching them on pound what they expected was another level again um but you know playing playing for the knights and being in that squad was a again another massive a massive achievement massive tick in the box proud proud moment for the family and myself uh again being with another whole lad danny out and we traveled together um but you know it was another step forward and as, as we keep going back it's what every young rugby league player wants to do it. They want to make the first team for the hometown team hometown club. They want to make uh, a final. They want to make an international appearance. Uh, and so it was another step in the right direction for myself, you know. Unfortunately enough after that it didn't it didn't flourish to anything else. We didn't kick on any, any further than that international level. But you know, it's still a massive achievement for myself and something I'm proud of. Yeah, definitely. And when uh, you lined up against France, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Dane Chisholm was lining up at full back. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that until <laughs> until last year when I was at Fev, uh, and Dane mentioned it. Obviously, Dane, Dane was at Feverson as well, 
Um, and it got brought up for some reason, and he said, "Oh yeah, I was I was fullback, and <laughs> I, I didn't know that until then, until he said." Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and obviously that season he scored 25 tries. I don't know if you know, Chris, but that was another Old Kingston Rovers record for yourself, the most Super League tries scored by a player. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. Nice. You got yeah, any more? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, we've got a couple more coming. So, yeah. I, thought, I thought you said Chris wasn't big enough for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but obviously uh, fantastic season 2011, four-year contract extension. You go then start the next 19 games of the new season and then you break your leg. What, yeah. uh, what was the emotions at the time and, and how gutted was you probably after having such a good run of games, getting into the England Knights and, and starting, obviously, you know, a good chunk of the of the season to then go suffer such a such a bad injury? Yeah, very, very disappointed and um, you know, gutted, really, because I said I had a, a great year 2011 and I thought I could kick on and maybe make another step further in, in, my, in my career uh, that 2012 season. But as you said, it was... Not to be played so many games and then and then brought my brought my leg and it was it was a stupid break as well you know I think it was early in the game I don't think I touched the ball yet and I it was it was a Catalan I think we playing Catalans at home it was a night game it was raining it was peeing down um, and I just I just pushed in support supporting the player and uh, he got tackled and I went to stop and I just slipped and my ankle went went underneath me and you know it had a crack and that was the end of it you know I had to. Go to hospital, get an operation the next day. I've, I've got a, a metal plate in my leg still, still to this day. So I've, I've got the memories of it and the scars of it. Um, and that, as I said that was my season over. That was my season over then, and I had to um, obviously rehab everything, make sure that the break was right, uh, repaired, um, and ready to get myself ready for the twenty thirteen year. How vital is rehab? Because I think. If we look now, if we go to compare you and Elliot Minchella, is he a former teammate of yours at Bradford? Did you play with Elliot? No, I didn't play with Elliot, no. That was a bit funny, but obviously he did his ACL second game of the season. He's been doing his rehab, obviously, on social media now. When you did it in 2012, it wasn't that big, but we've seen the journey, all the videos on Instagram. We played Dewsbury in a friendly two weeks from when we're recording this now. He's probably going to feature in that. How, on from your experience, was that nerve-wracking going back into that first game? And I think what Minchella, what I want him to do, as soon as he gets the kick-off, take it in, get that first carry, because then all the nerves will drop. How vital is a good rehab? Because you've got to come back bigger and stronger, aren't you? And I'm hoping, like you did, obviously, um, after 2012, that Elliot does the same, because it's a tough old journey, and I've done it myself. It's a long slog. It is, mate. It is a long a long slog, I say. It's a long, it's a long process. You can't rush them things. Uh, it can be lonely because everyone else is on the field training, having fun, playing games every week. And sometimes you're by yourself doing your rehab. You're in the gym by yourself, not around the boys as much because you're, you're doing different things. Um, but you, you've got to do it. You've got to be professional about it. You've got to get it right. You can't rush things. If you, you try and take shortcuts and rush back, you're just going to create more problems further down the line. You might you might reinter yourself. Um so, you know, take, I would say just take your time, take your time with these things, make sure it's 100% right. And then going, going back to what you want to see as a, as, as a fan, get the ball and take a carry and, and get straight back into it. And that's the best way. You know, I remember when I, when I came back from that, that broken leg, I was absolutely crapping myself thinking, I don't know if I can, I've got the nerve to do this and, and get back out there. Um, but like you said, you, you take that first carry or the, make the first tackle or whatever and, it completely goes like your head. You, you forgot about it, and you're you're in the, the game mindset, and 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 you're back you're back where you was before you before you had an injury. How much, Chris, did knowing that you've got a, a sort of a four year contract in your back pocket help your rehabilitation? Did it take a bit of pressure off you, and and a bit of worry coming back into the first team, knowing that you've you've still got a good number of years at the club ahead of you? Yeah, yeah, it took a bit of pressure off knowing I had. Still another three years at the club, so I had, I had plenty of time. I had time on my side, um, but again, being being probably at a good age where rugby players want to be at the best uh, at the time I was, uh, I didn't want to be out too long. Uh, I didn't want to rush back even. I just would have said, but I wanted to be back as as soon as I could. I didn't want to give other people the opportunities to to pinch my spot and make make that spot theirs. Um, I wanted that that centre spot mine and. Uh, I just didn't want to give anyone else an opportunity to pinch it off me or take it off me. Um, so as as much as I had time on my hands, I wanted to back out there and on the field as, as quick as I could. And, and I'm guessing that was your first major injury that you that you'd suffered. 
It was, yeah. That's yeah. that's my first major injury, and you know, touch wood, the the only major injury I've ever had in my career. You know, been going going quite a bit now, so I've been very lucky in my in my career so far. And from when you started, Chris, obviously till the back end of 2011, you were top, we've spoke heavily about Justin Morgan and how influential he was on you with Andrew Webster. When Morgs left and we got Sandercock in and this new era and you look at the signings that he made and then you look at like what he did in 2013, bringing people, you know, like Dixon and Caro, these unknown quantities and a bit of a new old Kingston Rovers team. How was that really difficult? Because the likes of Scotty Morrell, Newton, Galea, these legends of the club, Vela, they was all leaving. We had a few half-back pairings. Obviously, Blake went to Wigan and we signed Travis Baines. We struggled to get that momentum going. It was always one step forward, two step backwards. We'd have a really good result and then lose three on the bounce. And we, we, Did you realise we're going through a bit of a transition period here with the style of play, the training? We've spoke to a lot of people about Sander Cock. We've had loads of mixed reviews about what he thought about the Australians or the young kids. What was your experience as a Sandy in this new look Old Kingston Rovers side, obviously, before we move on to the Chester era and your final few at Old Kingston? Rovers, yeah. Um, you know, again, lose, losing all them players, them players who've been at the club for a few years and experienced players is always going to be tough, no matter what team or what coach you is in charge. It's always going to be tough losing experienced senior players and, and key players of the squad. Um, so it was a massive transition period, but I just, I just didn't think that that old KR, whether it was Sandy Clock or Joel Evers in charge, Mike Smith, I don't know, just didn't replace them players with the, with the same quality or experience. And that's no disrespect to the players that did come in, but it just, it just wasn't the same. And as you said, we'd, we'd win a game and maybe lose two or three then, have another good result. You know, there's that consistency consistency want there. Um, probably probably that expectation and professionals that them, them senior Aussie players did did bring in, sort of maybe dwindled, dwindled off a little bit. Um and, you know, towards towards Sandy Cook, he, he was okay. Sandy, I, you know, I, I got an okay with him, but he wasn't he wasn't everyone's cup of tea, as, as I say. Um, it did it did have his favourites. He had he had players who we who we, who we loved more than others, and you know, the, the young lads didn't really get get a fair shout or look in. Hmm. It's funny because we had uh, James Green on uh, a few Heritage Castle ago, and he. he he, he sort of said the same thing, but he he said that Santa Cock tried to make him into like a little project and try and and try and sort of bring out the best. But it's probably the methods that he employed that that players didn't react to. And th- did you find that he sort of? Um, I think Morel said as well, Joe, didn't he? That the whole lads or the the local lads just he, he seemed to yeah shunned know, out shunned out or yeah. you know he's quite abrasive with and and if your face didn't fit, you know you you was pretty much you know. You, you want Pat, you want in his thinking, and he was pretty much put to a side. Yeah, yeah, it, it was like that, you know. I don't, I don't think he was completely, completely honest, or he was good on man, man management skills. You know, instead of just being honest and say, saying to a player, "Look, like you're not, you're not playing this week for whatever reason, whether you weren't good enough last week, or I want to, I want to change the team," he, he would, he would beat around the bush a little bit and give you, give you daft excuses by why he's not playing. Yeah, and that was, that was to a few of the, us Hull lads as well. I, I was part of that as well. Um, but you know another thing that a lot of players didn't like about me he would never switch off about about rugby league you, every every time you saw him you walk past him in the corridor it's always rugby 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 you know he'd never he'd never stop and say oh, I was family back home or what he got on this weekend and it was just constant rugby and, and you know for some, for some people it, it's too much and you need that little break now and again and you know just, just a different conversation would, would be nice but you know Sandy he was obsessed with rugby league. I'm guessing at the time as well, Chris, you'll have been sort of one of the more senior players with your the amount of years that you've been at the club and yeah, the yeah. experience that you, you'd garnered. But how, you'd have still been quite young as well. So how was that sort of that um, dealing with that being sort of one of the most experienced players at the club in terms of how long you've been there, but also being quite young yourself? Yeah, it was a, it was a difficult difficult thing to really take or understand really because I, I was young and. I say I've been at the club a long time, but some of the players that was was coming in or had been in or after me, or I, I was a part of the squad was, you know, they played they played a, a long time, probably played at a higher level than me. Uh, There's a lot of, uh, a lot more experience than me, um, but you know, I, I felt like it was I felt like it was Michael, not Michael, but I I'm the boss and stuff like that. But you know, Ulkiar was me. I've been there that long. Um, 
you know, I loved it, and I, I, I wanted to be the, the not the main man there, but you know, I, I want like that. I was, I was, a, I was a quiet lad. I was never bossing people around. I'm, I'm, a, I get, and I want them kids to just stay quiet, get on with my job, and and do what I need to do. But because I've been there that that long, I was the most um, longest serving player there at, at the time. Um, I just want to be a part of everything. So, Joe, just before you go, then, so after saying that, then, Chris, how did you get on with Travis Baines? Yeah, I got I got on with, with Travis fine. To be fair, you know, I, I didn't I didn't hang around with him outside of rugby. Um, you know, he had his own little, you know, those sort of Aussies little sit together, and he he loved he loved like having a little drink now and again at a weekend after game and stuff. Like that. And you know, I'm I'm the complete opposite. After after a game and that, I'll I'll go home and chill out on with a with a wife and kids. Um, and you know, but at, at rugby, I honestly got on with him fine. I have no problems with Trav, but I, I, I know a few a few people did. Um, but to me, he was absolutely fine. Yeah. I think, well, to be fair, saying that about Sander Cock, every time I walk past our last, we speak about rugby, so I might be getting the same fate <laughs> there, because I think she's fed, I think she's as fed up as you must have been with Sander yeah. Cock, he's listening upstairs. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so we know it's when you signed your four-year contract, that would mean you'd be running out at the end of um, 2015, and you know not much really happened in 14, and we'll go on to that. You know, 15 season because again it's got such highs and lows and we've asked so many people about these questions but it's good to get different perspectives and especially you being a whole born lad we've obviously we've got to speak about Wembley we've got to speak about the re not renewing of your contracts with because of salary cap reasons and then what obviously Rovers went into the season after but when we spoke to Josh Mantellato who, you know, was, I think, yourself, Josh, Kenny Seo, Dixon at the beginning of the season, Campo, Kelly, them outside backs, a brilliant start to the season. And that was the first year since the Dobson period where I remember watching, I remember the Leeds game, I think the first game of the season, um, even though we got beat, I remember thinking there's some flair about this team, we've got something about us. Is that when, did you think maybe we've replaced them all these? Now, not to the extent of them, because they'd only played a few games at the beginning of the season, but signing the likes of Kenny C. Campo, Kelly, was really influential. And that was probably when Rovers started getting the groove back a little bit, even though from what we knew was yet to come. At the start, that, beating Hull FC, beating Huddersfield a few days later, the game against St Helens when Kelly did the two full lengths, very much like the 2009 season, some cracking results and very yeah. off the cuff and flair stuff. Yeah, it was, mate. You know, that year bringing them them players in, it felt like as I was going back in town with the, the Gleas and the Newton, the Develas, that, that era. Um, and I think it really showed throughout, throughout the year and probably the year's during their time at OKR, you know, there was there was really stand out and key plays for the club, wasn't they? Um and there there there's a massive part of that twenty fifteen year that got us got us all the way to Wembley. Yeah. Let's speak about Wembley. Obviously, we've spoke about it with so many people, like I've said, and we know what happened. We know everything. We've spoke about like the week before. Mantelato said about really bad preparation. Obviously it was such a hype. That semi final for Hullborn lad for playing that atmosphere probably the best atmosphere I've ever seen at a Hull Kingston Rovers game. Even though it would have been your final season, and we'll speak about that soon, that semi-final for the likes of the Hull lads who were there, you know, you, Salts, even the kids like Sonny Esselman, all them boys who have come up through the academy, that was a very, very proud day. And obviously we know what came, but what's your thoughts on that Challenge Cup run? Because it all went well, and then obviously we know we probably didn't prep the best and there was a few things went wrong leading up and we came up against a very, very good lead side. But yeah. to represent your club at Wembley, forget about the result, forget about whatever happened on the day. To say you played at the National Stadium for OKR must have been a very, very good achievement. And obviously we know it didn't go well, but tell yeah, us about yeah. your day. No, yeah, mate. Again, that semi-final... Um... Out at Edinley, atmosphere as you said, as you mentioned, was was unbelievable. And I just remember being being nervous, like even throughout the game, like even when I was playing, carrying the ball, tackling, just nervous completely throughout the game because I was I was so desperate for for us to win and to get to Wembley. Uh, that's all that's all I ever wanted you know, to get there with with OKR and um, be part be part of some more history. Um, and so that game, I was absolutely nervous. But as soon as, as soon as the final whistle went, and obviously we was there, um, unbelievable feelings. Uh, again, proud for the family, myself, fans going mad, uh, all the boys celebrating, some people crying. You know, just just 
just realise how, how big it is, how big of an achievement and, and what it meant to a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I said, getting to Wembley, and actually being there, walking out, you know, I said, despite the result, um, it was unbelievable. The, the full week, the full week leading up to the game, um, preparation, as, as you mentioned, wasn't wasn't great, but, you know, getting a send-off from, from the stadium, leaving leaving the city um, from, from Craven Park all the way out, we made about, I don't know, maybe about 20, 30 stops on the bus on the way out, just saying thank you and waving to people, uh, families there. It was, it was the best week, best week of rugby I've ever had. So where do you think it went wrong on the pitch then? <laughs> uh, when, the, when the referee, yeah, when the free kicked <laughs> off, those <it was> whistles. <laughs> no, um, you know, so we came, we came up against a red hot, red hot lead side. Yeah. Things didn't go our way. Uh, we had a few a few dodgy decisions and dropped balls and you know people people wasn't 100 percent at the best um you know it's probably to be a lead side in a final you need you need all all your squad to be probably eight out of ten players you know rated eight out of ten to, to really compete and be there and, you know on that day sadly we wasn't we wasn't nowhere near where we should have been and didn't give a, a good account of ourselves which was really disappointing and upsetting because obviously being being my hometown club and the club that I grew up from from the academy all the way to the to the top, it it would. I think he's left us because we're speaking <laughs> about Wembley. <laughs> Not more dodgy Wi-Fi problems. It's been absolutely fine, but we'll get yeah. we'll keep going, guys. Because literally, Chris will be back in a minute. It happened with Quinlan. It happens sometimes. It's um, it's normally yours, isn't it, Chris? But at the minute, how good's this chat? Do you know what I? I always say about I love these heritage casts. I'm glad. Obviously, we've got a few weeks until our preseason, and we're going to start doing more just casts about the games and stuff. But I really like doing these heritage cast because you just hear different perspectives. And Chris is a really good talker as well. And as we say, he's back now. Chris, can you hear us, buddy? I can, mate. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Did you keep me out? We, we no, thought you had enough for me. On about Wembley. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I wish, we did, I, we wish did I could Adam, have done that at Wembley. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we did Adam Quinlan about two weeks ago, and this happened about three times. I mean, we just had to keep rolling and rolling, so we'll try it. Yeah, well, yeah but got at least Adam. In, so. I was going to say at least Adam Quinlan was halfway around the world. I think Chris is only on all road. <laughs> 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 but going speaking out about 2015, we know that was your last season with Rovers and um, Chesy. When did this happen? Because I remember for a lot of fans, including myself, and you know, I uh, people think I'll just say it because you're on the podcast now, but very disappointed to see you go. I think if you, I always look at 2016, obviously, we know they got relegated that season, but the people who they replaced with and the money they spent elsewhere, kind of in this new era, in this new direction, we know went to pot. Was it must have been tough? It must have been tough, and it, it's a, you know not the nicest subject to talk about. But when did you know your time at Old Kingston Rovers were up? And initially, how did you deal? Because it's been part of your life since two thousand six, nearly coming up to a testimonial, um, yeah. and it it, it it really put a dampener, especially with losing a few whole lads as well that season. Then we ended up losing like Salts and Benny a few years later. It was kind of that that first Super League team and that them heroes who would seem was slowly fading away. And I remember when you left, you know, a lot a lot of sad people in the East, North and West Stand. Yeah, yeah. Good for you and your family. Yeah, mate, I was I was absolutely good. I I never thought it would it would happen. Um and it, uh, that's not me saying I was too complacent. I thought I'd ever I'd be there forever. But I really wanted to be. Um, but you know, beginning of that, beginning of that two, 2015 season, before even we played a, a preseason in friendly, I got told at the beginning of the year that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be needed. I wouldn't play. I wouldn't play for OKR again. I don't, that, I don't before get that. that year. Sorry to interrupt, but if you, what about if you'd have gone on and been a standout player, scored 30 tries, played for England? Do, do you know what I mean? I don't get how you yeah. can make them. Them decisions so early, and I always think that about Australia. Sorry to butt in, but like we know, Josh Hodgson's already going to play for Parramatta next year. He might rip it up again, but he's already sold. It's I think it's such a tough, yeah, it's a yeah. cutthroat business, isn't it, mate? It is, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as I said at the beginning of that year, I got told that I wasn't, I wasn't going to play for OKR again, and I can go on loan this year if I want. If they've got something sorted for me, and I, you know, I, I just turned around and basically said no. I said. Um, I'm not going nowhere. I'll stay, and if you're not going to play me, I'll I'll, I'll train. I'll train my artist and I'll try and get in the squad. Uh, but yeah, I'm going nowhere. I want to stay here. Uh, and they said, right, well, do what you like. Then you're not you're not going to play here. And you know, 
be all and end all of it. I, I think I, I missed two or three games that year and I played every, every game of the season. We got to Wembley, so uh, another great year. Um, yes. And, you know, before before the Wembley game, and uh, probably a week or two weeks before that, uh, I got told, oh, we want to keep you now. Uh, we we'll offer you <laughs> off, offer you a contract. Yeah, that's what I was like. Yeah, I want to offer you a contract now. It's like, all right, yeah, sweet. I mean, I, I never wanted to leave, so if they offered me something, I, I want to sign it. And they said, oh, we'll get we'll get Wembley out of the way, and then and then we'll sort it out. And uh, Wembley came and went, and um, I was I was asking every week, have we got something sorted? And they kept saying, oh, we'll do it next week. We we'll do it next week. And you know, before you know it, you're playing the last game of the season. Um, and I said, I said, I went back in and I said, look, we need to get something sorted. And I said, oh, we've got no money left now. I'm like, all right, well, when was you going to tell me this? And so, you know, um, last game of the season came and went. There's no contract on the table no more. They've just pulled it straight away. Said there's nothing there. Me and my wife and my little girl was flying to Australia uh, for a holiday for a month straight as soon as the season finished. So, you know, we was, you know, I was in Australia, no club, nothing. Um Standing People outside was, NRL training grounds, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we spent a month in Australia, and I, I was coming home, and you know, people were starting starting preseason training again, and I, I didn't have a club. I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought I was going to be at OKR still, and, you know. So I was really left down down shit street, really. And you know, that's when that's when I, I got I ended up getting an agent, and you know, Bradford Bradford um, was the club that took me in. It's a, it's a very, very bizarre way of doing business, isn't it? Telling someone at the start of the season that you've got no, you're not part of the plans. And then, like you say, you go and swap play 30 odd games for them, score 13 tries, featuring a Challenge Cup final. You know, it's a very odd way of doing things. The, the, the reason at the time I think Chris Chester gave was for salary cap reasons. Is, is there any truth that you was one of the top earners and they needed to offload you? Um, um, maybe, yeah. I don't know about a top earner, but I was on, I was on, I was on a, a, a good wage um, and that's that's one of the reasons why at the end of the year when they said they didn't want me I, I kind of said you know F you I'll sit here then and, and collect my money sort of yeah. thing um, and I, I'll, I'll train and try and get in the squad and I think they was a bit pissed off and that's why I said well, well you won't play for this club again and then you know that 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 pissed me off more and I was like alright well I'll just fucking I'll, I'll sit here sorry about swearing I said I'll, I'll sit that's here right. and, I'll sit here and collect my money then it's a sad uh, way, though, to deal with someone who's is, obviously it, been at the club for such a long time. And, had, and obviously, you know, you had such an affinity with the supporters as well. Uh, and this is why, we, like me and Joe were saying, we like doing these heritage casts, because when you stood on the terraces and you read the newspapers, you don't you don't know this at the time. You don't no, know no, one, no one knows really what, what goes on behind the scenes and stuff like that. But, you know, as I said earlier, Ulki I was, was my club. I felt like it was my club. I've been there a long time. I loved it there. I thought I'd, I'd I'd just play my full career there, and that'd be it. And you know, when when 2015 came about, beginning of the year, I was absolutely gutted and didn't know what I was going to do or what I would do after that. Um, very very similar to Craig Hall as well, Chris. Sorry, we did a mm -hmm. podcast with Craig again. Who you know, a, a really a whole legend of the club, and it's such a sad way. And you know, we didn't know he was going to say this, and I was very similar. One with John o when um, Craig Hall told us how Tony Smith said the same thing to him, and it's yeah. kind of like. Just, you just can't justify it, and you know, no, what, yeah. we're on the podcast. But your last game against Salford before we move on to Bradford, <laughs> and then you move to Manchester, um, must have been a, a weird occasion. You got on the track, you know, you scored, but you knew it was your last appearance. It was very emotional. It must have been for you. And then tell us, obviously, about dropping down into the Championship, playing for Bradford, a new setup, a brand new life as a rugby league player. Tell us about the last game for Rovers, and then moving to Oddsall. Yeah, yeah. I say last game was against Salford at um, at Craven Park, which was was lucky enough for me. So I have a, I have a great send off from from the fans and my family. You know, walking out with my little girl at the time and doing a lap of honour at the end was was something I'll never forget. Getting a great send off, uh, you know, scored scored another try. So I mean, we've talked about scoring on debuts, and you know, it was great to score score my last game as well. Um, but you know. Didn't want the game to end really because I I knew that would be it and that would be the end. And they say it was a was a bit emotional doing some interviews after the game and saying bye to people and stuff like that. But you know, it's, I suppose everything in life, everything's got to come to an end at some at some point. And you know, a change is sometimes good and brings out the best in people. And you know, it certainly did for myself. And I went to Bradford, albeit in the Championship, there was there was still a full time club at the time, so I I didn't have to look for another job. Uh, 
as, as well as playing rugby. Um, I know I had, I had a great year at Bradford. I think I scored something like 29 tries in 30 games. Um, um, I've, I've, I'm sure we won the playoff playoff play or something like that. We won, won, yeah. some, kind of, won some kind of trophy there. Um, again, great year for myself personally. Uh, I loved it there, to be fair. It was, it was another great club, but unfortunately for them, they, they fell into a bit of financial difficulty and led into administration. Um, you know, people, us players wasn't getting paid, wasn't insured and, you know, nothing was getting relayed back to us from the club. So we, we were just getting led on really down, down the garden path. And, you know, the boy, the boys at Bradford took a stance in the end and said, look, we, we can't train. We're not, well, we're not going to train because one, we're not getting put, put, uh, paid and the other one, we're not insured. So if one of us gets injured, then that's it. We're, we're, we're buggered. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, look, lucky enough for me, uh, Marwan and Marwan Kukash and uh, Ian Watson um, came sniffing around me, and they invited me, offered me to go down to Salford, and um, that's that's what I'll say at Salford. Yeah, yeah, three years, obviously, with a Manchester club. Um, really, I mean, I always thought it was quite weird when you was playing against Rovers. I always think that against players who played for so long. How did you find that your first game? I remember I remember you scoring against, I think, the Challenge Cup 2019. I think we won that game. But really enjoyable three years. And so Ian Watson kind of transformed you, didn't you? Because you, uh, your team, sorry, not you individually, but Ro- Rovers obviously went down the million-pound game. Salford stayed up. That could have been so different, you know, for them last two yeah, minutes. Yeah. Salford had probably been in more trouble than Rovers. And I look back now and think if Rovers want to come up that season in 2017, you'd probably look at like what Widnes are doing now, Chris, in the Championship. Yeah, yeah. That could have been all KR. Obviously, we've got a big fan base and would have probably supported them. But Salford had stayed up. They'd sat, made some big signings, playing with the likes of Maydock Masilla. And then eventually, you ended up playing in a grand final. And again, not winning the grand final, coming up against a really good Saints team in, in 2019. But out of a rubbish situation of getting released by Rovers, liquidation at Bradford, you ended up doing three years in the Super League, again, playing a lot of games. I think looking at your stats now, you know, 95 games again for Salford, 30 tries. So really enjoyable for you. And I bet you didn't think at the time after two crap years that you'd go on and play for a really successful team in their own way for what you guys were expecting at the AJ Bell. Yeah, yeah. You know, as as was said, um, leaving all I thought that, that was it. That was, that was the end of it. And mm-hmm. You know, dropping down to the championship and playing for Bradford, I thought Super League days was probably probably over and gone with. Um, but you know, lucky enough for me, as I said, Marwan and 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 Watto came sniffing around and and took me in. Um, and as we said earlier, a change is is sometimes good for a lot of people, and, and it certainly was in my case. I probably probably played my best, most consistent rugby I've ever played at, at Salford. Um, uh, and we, I said we had a great a great time there. Loved it there. It's a great setup, great set of players. Not 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 a team full of world class players or standout players, but we had a a team. And and what I always said this, and it always sticks to me. He had a, a lot of players. He based his team on. He would sign players who other teams would would have let go and said, right, you're not quite you're not quite good enough for this team, or you've had an injury and they've let them go. And our team was full of them. Uh, and what I wanted to prove all them other managers wrong and prove to us players that you are good enough and you still can make it at this level. And we had we had a team full of them players that had been let go by other clubs uh, and, was, and got said to them that they wasn't quite good enough or weren't, weren't ready for it. And what all brought all that confidence out of them and, and made made us really click as a team and be a successful team. Yeah, and I'm sure uh, that, that 2019 season is going to going to stay long in your memory for for a long time did, did even at the start of the season did you envisage that you might do what you did no 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 again again with Oki at the beginning of that year when we got to the challenge cup final no no one expects Oki to get to it especially that 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 year or that 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 period of time no one no one expects the likes of Oki or Salford to get to the challenge cup final do they as much as we love our club mm-hmm. pe- people don't expect that of, of clubs like that and you know, so it's a massive achievement for yourself and you I know teams always sit down at the beginning of the year and and they like to set goals that they they want to win something or make a final or something like that but you know at Salford we didn't we didn't set a goal to win a cup or make a final I think we just wanted to our main goal at Salford was 
for other teams to to look at Salford and not think, oh, it's going to be an easy game or it's it's a win. We wanted to change that perception of what people think of Salford. Oh, it's going to be a tough game now. It's going to be a real hag and got to fight hard here. Got to work hard to win this game or if you're not on your game, Salford will turn you over. And you know, in the in the three four years that I was at at Salford, I think I think we really did do that. I think we made people look at Salford different. Mm. Yeah, I think the problem with being so good and overachieving is people sniff around, don't they? You look at Josh Jones yeah. went to FC, Jackson Hastings went to Wigan, and that's the season after, obviously, a COVID hit season. It's like a new look team, isn't it? And obviously it was. It's yeah. it's hard to it's it's hard to keep that consistency, isn't it? After, it is. obviously. But obviously a Challenge Cup final in yeah, 2020. I was, I was about to say that. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? A 20 of behind closed doors. What yeah. that's just ridiculous. Uh, tell us about that. Well, come on, it's got, yeah. it's got to be gone from yeah. playing at 70,000 in 2015 to seven at 2020. <laughs> yeah, again, just going back to like people sniffing around, taking Josh Jones and Jackson Hastings, them kind of plays because we wasn't littered with star studded players such as Jackson Hastings, he, he was our main player and our best player. Uh, but because the team wasn't scattered with all them, was all. I don't know, probably above average players just playing playing together with the team and, and working out for each other. The players that came in just fitted straight in. As I said, the next year we made a Challenge Cup final. What I brought the best out of players. Um, but yeah, going back to that COVID hit season and zero fans at Wembley, it it, it was unreal. As I said, I've experienced it with, with Ulkia and when it's been, been packed out. Um, the year before that at, at Old Trafford, packed out. And then walking out to Wembley was, was just surreal, empty. So I've experienced it. I've experienced it on both sides of the coin. Um, but you know, as soon as, as soon as you kick off and you're into the game, the the, the noise and the atmosphere that like, just goes out the window, and you you focusing on your job and stuff like that. It's only when the ball goes out of play or someone scored a try, and, and you you're looking around just for that that minute or so, and you, and you really yeah. realise how big the stadium is and how empty it is, and 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 how much noise you can just hear from everyone just talking. It's it, yeah, it's an unreal feeling. A little bit yep. closer this time around as well, wasn't it? A little bit closer. <laughs> it I was, what, it I was, I remember watching yeah. it, James Greenwood went over and then was it Reese Williams as well? I thought, do you know what they're going to do? They said, yeah. obviously, Luke Gale, um, who's now obviously at the black and white, slotting a drop goal. Came so yeah. close, but um, a great achievement, again, from when people had written you off after so losing so many players in 2020. It, it, it was, yeah. Um, again, yeah, I think that makes it worse, you know, losing by by one point so so close at the end, you know, as the boys was absolutely good and um as I keep going back, we want a team full of full of star players. We just worked hard for each other, which made it so much harder to take. Um we we really thought we, we was gonna win that game and we even during even up until that last drop goal we thought we thought we could still do this and and, and win. And you know, even during that game I knew I knew my year after that was going to be at Ferguson. It was all sorted for then. So it, it especially hit me hard. You know, I, I, I was really upset after that game because I knew that would be probably my last chance being at Wembley and having a chance of, of winning a cup. Uh, but uh, again, be all and end all the following year. We, I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> we there, exactly. Yeah. The hell you've been in more finals than in <laughs> after, you know, yeah. the, the Lakers or something like that, or St. Ellen's at the minute when we look back. Now. Wembley, Wembley's in your home ground. Literally, isn't it? I'm <laughs> surprised you're not doing it now. But um, Featherston, yeah, really, obviously, before we go and speak about Sheffield for this year and your business and pump that, tell us about Fev because we see from the outsides, a little village in West Yorkshire who's got passionate <laughs> fans. I hope no one's listening. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get a lot of stick, aren't I? But, um, no, let's be honest, a really old-fashioned rugby league club who can produce some good rugby, some good local lads, and they've got a bit of money. You look at the team now, I mean, you've been replaced by Joey Lulea. Do you know what I mean? Or yeah, Lulea, yeah. whatever you want to call him, who won a, um, who's been playing for Samoa and played in grand finals in the NRL. So, Featherstone always seem a bit of a tight-knit club. Obviously, you got to play... In the 1895 Cup final, playing with the likes of Craig Hall, Chisholm again. There's a lot of ex-Rovers players in that team. Really enjoyable year again after a, um, a COVID-struck year and obviously coming up short in another final. Million-pound game the week after Rovers had got beat in the semi-final. Tough place to go in at the south of France. I watched the million-pound game. It's a very hostile crowd. It is, yeah. And uh, pretty very similar to, to the Catalan crowd, you know, when when their their team's on top, they can create a really good atmosphere and it's a 
an intense atmosphere as well. I feel like they're really on top here, banging drums and chanting and stuff. And it was the same same for Toulouse. Their fans, they've got a great fan base there, a great little setup they've got. And their fans were on top. And, you know, they started that game really well. I mean, I think we were like 16 nil down before we knew it. Um, yeah. And I'll give ourselves too much of a hill to climb. So again, wasn't wasn't to be to be our game, uh, our day there. But I said Fev this year have recruited exceptionally well, uh, new coach as well. And I think he'll he'll really bring a different level of professionalism and attitude to towards that team. Um, and I expect a really big thing from them. Uh, I reckon they'll be the team that will be up there this year and get promoted. Tell us about the transition from playing professional full time rugby league to to going to Featherstone on a part time basis. Yeah, um, the transition was was fairly easy. You know, I, um, my father in law has got his own pest control business, and you know, for the last five or six years, I've been working with him in the off season, getting to know it. I've done my my exams and courses that I need to. So work wise was was sorted for after rugby, but the the, the thing that hit me most was you know working all day working. Early, with getting up early in the morning and finishing late, and then going straight to training on the night is it's a it's a different it's a different world, you know. You don't realize being a full time player what then part time players go through and have to do, and then play on a weekend on a Sunday, then back out for work on a Monday. It's a, it's a different life, and you have a total newfound respect for for them part time players. Yeah, and I think that's probably unfortunately why you look at other sports, Chris, and the funding that other sports get. And you you look at the FA Cup, City playing Everton at weekend. It could go either way. And there's teams in League Two that beat so um, it beat Premiership teams on the odd occasion. Unfortunately, in some situations in the Championship and League One, funding such a big issue when you've got one end of the spectrum like yourself when you was at Fev, Toulouse, Halifax, who have got a bit of money, and then you're coming up against some teams who were based like university teams like West. Wales or in, I know they're in League One but there's a lot of up and coming development teams but unfortunately sometimes it doesn't look the best on the score sheet because there is the likes yeah. of yourself who can play part time who've been there and done that but then you've got lads who have never really played the sport at that level it's such a weird weird division it's a really exciting division as well going into 2022 with the new TV rights there's the Premier Sports deal but you know it's good that it's getting that recognition and um, I'm just you're hoping that you don't get Cornwall in the Challenge Cup and have to travel down there <laughs> oh god that would be torture wouldn't it I mean going back to travelling like down to Cornwall I mean Sheffield uh, have moved back to actually playing in Sheffield this year. You yeah. know, they haven't had a stadium in Sheffield. They've been yeah. playing away for the last couple of years and it is going to be ready this year, but not while not while the end of March, I believe. So the first the first six, seven, eight games are all away. Uh, you know, believe it or not, out of Cumbria them three times. Out, out of that seven games, we've got Cumbria three times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, begin you know, beginning of February, January, February time, you know what it's gonna be like down there and it's gonna be cold, wet, muddy, rainy. Uh, and we've got to go there three times. So not looking forward to that. Well, yeah. Chris, when you was at Salford, did you did you move over, or was you still living living in Hull? No, yeah, we moved over for my for my first year. Uh, we lived there for a year, me and my wife and two children then. Yeah. Um, but my wife didn't really didn't really settle. She didn't like being away from the family. You know, she was at home with her children by herself while I was at training and couldn't really get out. Didn't know where she was going and stuff. Um, so she wanted to be back home around people she knew. My little girl was was in nursery about to start school so um and i knew i wasn't gonna be at salford forever and we would move back home so instead of disrupting my my, my little girl's school life um where we're starting in manchester and moving back home we just thought we'll move back home get everyone settled get get air in school and i'll just draw the shorts draw and, and travel for the next next three years and that's what happened yeah how did yeah. you find it? It's long, it's tough in it. I am the M62, especially when there's a crowd. I mean, we've done it numerous times, haven't we, Chris? And we'll start doing it again in a few weeks. But the problem with Hull, every away game is at least 45 minutes away. You know, you look at Wakey, Leeds, Cass, Dewsbury, yeah. Bev, Batley, they're all in a 10 mile radius. We yeah. have to, you know, get past goal before we even see any time <laughs> for a team. Yeah, mate, it, it was tough traveling, you know. Um, I was I was leaving leaving my house like half five in the morning, you know, to beat traffic and get there just just to be precautious that there was no going to be no accidents. I was I was meeting two two and then three of the boys at Uddersfield and with car share from there, so you know I'd do an hour by myself and an hour with them. And uh, you know when it, when it fell my turn to drive, I'd be I'd be driving straight through. I was picking them boys up and straight through to Salford, so 
there, there was long long days you know being, being full time um it was it was like monday tuesday thursday friday it was it was just relentless but you know i, I look back now when i'm getting up for work in the morning i think couldn't be bothered now driving to Manchester at this time. Uh, I don't know. How I did it for for so long, but I, I I think you just get into into autopilot and and just and just crack on with it. Yeah. Well, if you were doing it now, Chris, obviously you'd be able to listen to the Red Robin podcast on the on your drive. So that'd kill I would, yeah. Hours, it? Wow, <laughs> so going to Sheffield, mate. Obviously. You, with your fifth club, like we've mentioned, bit, they're in a bit of a transition as well. Obviously, they've had Mark Aston, who's still the coach of Sheffield, legend, uh, made a lot of signings along with yourself, Vila Halafifi, Mikey Wood, Liam Kirk, a few players from Oldham, Hunslet making the move. There's a, um, some Hull lads in there as well. I've seen Harry Tyson Wilson played against yep. him. He was all Guzzi, Connor Bauer, Anthony Fackery. So I'm guessing there's going to be a whole bus going to South Yorkshire again. And what's your aims going into 2022? Obviously in the Championship, probably one of the middle teams with funding and probably expectations, but probably looking forward to getting back at it. And again, a new challenge for Chris Wellham. It is, yeah. Um, as I said, I said mention all them Hull boys there. I think, I think there's seven of us from Hull. From yeah. So we've got two cars two cars going for Mull and we train, we train three nights a week on a, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. So... You know, if you if your drive falls all right, you only have to drive once every two weeks. So mm. that that's that's massive, a massive part of, of why why I wanted to stand there as well. There's so many Hull boys there, um, I, and I know Gus from from Ulkiago's deck. I know I, I'm Thackeray, uh, very well. Lily's on the same same estate as me. Uh, Connor Bauer, I've got to know him really well. He's in our he's in our car uh, that we share. Um, but you know, going in, going into the year, and oh, going back onto the players as well, the big transition at the club at the minute. As you mentioned, the players that they brought in, some of the players they brought in, I think they've, I think they released fifteen players at the end of last year. So I mean, that, that's a massive, that's a massive part of the squad. So it is a, a transitional period for the for the club, but we've got a lot of a lot of good championship players in, a lot of, a few experienced championship championship players in. We just brought Ben John Bishop in as well. Um, yeah, he'll be he'll be massive as well. Very very experienced. Are you going to be on his side, or we're not giving any tactics away just yet? <laughs> well, he's been a bit been a bit mixed at the minute. He's been he's been flipping both sides, so I'm not sure where what where Mike Ashton wants to play him. Um, but we'll, he's been we'll playing um, a bit of both. rugby union sevens, Annie for Jamaica. I don't know. Has he? Yeah, has I'm he? sure. I'm sure he's been playing rugby union sevens. Still got some right. wheels on yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he can still move. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, going going into this year for myself, I mean. I'm not sure if it's going to be my last year or not, or, or not. I'm not sure. I'm going to see how I feel come end of the year, how the body's feeling, uh, or what Sheffield think. Uh, but potentially it could be. It could be my last year. So if I can just offer a bit of experience to uh, some of the young lads going through, or I said the, the club in a transitional period, if I can help in any way, uh, I will do, and I'll pass some some knowledge on, and, and I said do my part in helping the team uh, be successful this year. Yeah, and I suppose you're in a in a bit of a different place now, Chris, because you you're probably able to to be a bit more choosy about what you do with a with your time away if you do want to continue playing. Because obviously now you you're semi pro and you and you're working with your your father in law Gary. Tell us a bit more about the business and the and the line of work you're in now. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm into pest control. Um, so and, plenty and of pests in East Hull, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of pests. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's, he's had his, he's had his own his own business for twenty twenty six years, and he worked for the council for twelve years before that. So he's very well established in in the pest control business. And you know, looking for me, um, I, I can fall straight into that. As I said earlier, I've done my exams and courses, and um, I'm into that line of work now. So, and any pests, rodents, birds, ants, wasps, anything class of the pest, mate, we 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 can sort out and. You know, it's a, it's a different line of work. I mean, I've never had a, a real job, if you, if you want to call it. All I've done is rugby league. Um, so, again, it, it's new to me. I love it. Um, every every day is different. Every job is different, meeting new customers, new people. So, man, I'm, I'm enjoying this sad life at the minute. I'll be honest with you, mate. I haven't got a clue how you do that. I'm a right funny when it comes to stuff like that. <laughs> I, I don't to be fair, try and get on I'm a Celeb when you retire. Pick up a 50 grand or so, you'll win it. <laughs> well, you'll do all the challenges. Well, yeah, you won't have to worry about that. But honestly, mm. take my hat off to you because I, I couldn't do it. Chris, could you? Uh, well, to be fair, um, I'm chief spider catcher in this house. So I, I won't be tapping up Chris. But maybe you should give uh, your lassie's number 
in oh. case there's any spiders in your house, get them on speed dial to come. Well, I'll well, jump on the sofa and she grabs a cup. So <laughs> I don't think I'll be your apprentice, Chris. <laughs> But honestly, mate, it's been great to speak to you. We always finish with these Heritage Cast by asking what's been your favourite moment, maybe a favourite game or best memory of being a Hull Kingston Rovers player. Yeah, uh, I, th- I think there's a couple, you know, so obviously making my debut uh, and then my last game as well, they'll always stick out. But, you know, being, being a Hull lad, my hometown club, it has to be, has to be walking out at Wembley. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, yeah. 191 games, 102 tries. Challenge Cup final, Challenge Cup final. We saw for grand final. We've been, you know, you've been through the mill, haven't you, mate? You've had a lot of ups and downs. And yeah. it's been fantastic to talk to him, hasn't it, John? I mean, we've got a few Heritage casts coming up soon. Another one's just confirmed while we've been doing the one with Chris. Obviously, we won't release it. We are trying to get Terry Campese's done ASAP. We're going to try and do it next week. But these casts just offer something different, don't they? It's been really enjoyable again, John. Yeah, and a couple more uh, stats for you, Chris. He was the uh, record Super League appearance holder for Rovers and also the record try scorer as well for Rovers during his time at the club. Yeah, so it's nice, isn't it? Love that. Okay. I so love that. Racking, yeah. racking We're going to have to make your screen a bit bigger for your head. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, yeah. I, I, I suppose final question, Chris, and, and you've been on the inside of you know some tremendous wingers of your time, you know, playing rugby league, John Steele, Peter Fox, Dave Hodgson, Eddie Gardner, Josh Mantelato, who, who did comment on our Instagram page when uh, we said that he was coming on. He said that you was one of his favourites. And, and I suppose I wondered, did you, was you on an assist bonus for, for Mantelato? Because you, you must have set him up that many times. Yeah. You know what? The, the, the story behind how I actually got involved with Salford, I what on Marwan come because they was actually looking at, at Josh to sign Josh. <laughs> Right. This is no, this is no way of like so what what mm. I was telling me. Um, they was looking to sign Josh Mantelato and I was watching his his clips. Um, and as you said, there was there was many assists from from myself to him yeah. uh, that that year, the year before, whatever it was. Uh, and then they said, "Bloody hell, why don't we just why don't we get him?" <laughs> and so that, that's how it came about. Me <laughs> signing for Salford, and how, how the interest came about. They was actually looking at Josh's clips, and they recognised me on there, so they the, the jumped in for me. Yeah, and if anyone out, found out all the exclusives, Chris. Yeah, I was gonna say, and, and if anyone is watching or, or listening to this, and you haven't listened to the uh, Mantle Arts or Heritage cast, get on that because it was a, a really good one and uh, it gives us some great insight, especially into that Salford defeat, the million pound game, about how raw it was and how emotional it was. But it was a great guy. But just going back to, to the original question, who, who's, who's probably the best winger that you've played inside? Um, I w- I, I'd say probably. Partnership wise, probably and trying. I said Josh. Josh was was probably the partner, but you know Dave Hodgson was, was unbelievable. Like his knowledge of the game, um, and constant talking and telling people where to be, and his positional was was unbelievable. He was he was probably the best and professional winger that that I played with. Um, but you know, again, going back to partnership wise and scoring tries wise, um, Josh Mantel out oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Dave Hodgson's still bombing it in his yellow T-shirt, giving instructions. In I it. know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, still, I still talk to Audio now and again. Um, yeah, so very well. And yeah. we've just got one question, Joe, from uh, yeah. Abby Brown. Now she says, if you could come back to car, would you? But I suppose we'll slightly change that. And have you ever had the opportunity to come back to Rovers? You know what? There was, there was a, an opportunity when Tim Sheens was there. Um, and it was the year, the year that he ended up leaving. Um, that year. Nah, yeah, that that year he he was interested in me. And he, he we was talking a little bit uh, about coming back, uh, and then unfortunately he he left for whatever reason, whatever his circumstances was, or whatever happened with the club. I don't know, but um, yeah, that 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 went silent after that. But while he was there, we was talking. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Get on the phone to West Tigers. You might get a gig next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, mate. Honestly, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And it's been, you know, great to speak to you. And we really thank you for giving up your time. Hey, no problem, mate. Thank you for having me. No worries, guys. So this has been the first episode of 2022. The first Heritage cast. I remember Hulkingston Rovers start the season in two weeks pre-season. And there'll be much more podcasts from me and Chris. And remember, it'll be sponsored by Budget Tyres and 360 Chartered Accountants, the Red Robin podcast sponsors for 2022. So from me, Joe Pliard, Chris Johnson and Chris Wellham, we will see you very soon up the Robins. Thank you, Chris. Speak to you soon, mate. Cheers, mate. See you, mate, boys.